Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. The story behind the stories is what you get here, and today we're talking with Michael Meme. Uh, Michael joined us last year to talk about his book at the time called Planet Side, and today we're talking about the sequel to that book. It's called Space Side. Such a great, great book. If you are a fan of military sci-fi or sci-fi adventure, this book really spans uh, multiple subgenres, and it's one of my favorite sci-fi books of the year. Before we get into our interview with Michael, I'd like to thank some sponsors who make this show possible. Be sure to use the Amazon links in the show notes to show support for Michael to buy his books, and uh, we also earn a small, small commission from that as well. Edge of Valor, a military sci-fi thriller by Josh Hayes. When their mission fails, his begins. David Weber calls it a tour de force. Special Agent Jackson Fisher is a man after truth. When a military operation to extract a high-ranking ambassador from the war-torn border world of Stonemeyer ends in disaster, Fisher is called in to investigate. A whole platoon went in, but only three Alliance Marines returned home. The rest killed in action along with hundreds of civilians. With tensions between the Holloman Alliance and Stonemeyer rising, Fisher attempts to stitch the pieces together. One thing becomes more and more certain. The surviving Marines are lying. As the truth unfurls, Fisher begins to realize this was far more than a simple rescue mission and that the truth might be something best left buried. Filled with action, mystery, and well-crafted characters, Edge of Valor, the Valor series book one, will put you into a world of war, conspiracy, and betrayal. It's perfect for fans of David Weber's Honorverse or Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan with a futuristic flair. That's Edge of Valor by Josh Hayes. Chronicle of the Five by Garrett Godrick from Book One. A peculiar boy with a remarkable ability, a secret society on a dark crusade, an extraordinary device that could change the world. 14-year-old Cody Calder is a frightened, insecure boy who wants nothing more than to find courage and self-worth, and he has a difficult decision to make. He can go with his family and confront his fears or stay behind and hide at his uncle's farm. If he stays, he must say goodbye to the two most important people in his life. If he goes, his decision could change him forever. Cody's choice lands him in a faraway place where he finds himself on an unexpected path filled with mind-bending twists of fate and decision. And Cody's quest for self-discovery becomes a nightmare as he struggles to survive in an extraordinary new world, one he never knew existed. Book 1, Dark Revenant, and Book 2, Dark Legacy are available now with Book 3 coming soon. Chronicle of the Five by Garrett Godrick. R.J. Panero and his brand new book, Chilling Effect, a global climate thriller. A ruthless eco-terrorist, a woman determined to stop him. Chilling Effect, R.J. Panero's newest thriller, explores a world in the not-too-distant future where terrorism is taken to a new level, one with world-ending consequences. You never know what you're capable of until the monster inside of you pushes you beyond your moral line in the sand. These are the opening thoughts of former climatologist William Christed as he prepares to attack our delicate ecosystem. He's hell-bent on avenging his father's death and will go to extremes of terrorism never before seen, all to strike a blow to those whose hubris led to his father's demise. He will take full advantage of the greed and narcissism ever-present in the world as well as the fragility of our planet to ecological terrorism and use it to plot a scenario so grim yet so compellingly real it could have ripped from today's headlines. Check out the brand new thriller Chilling Effect from R.J. Panero. Michael Anderley has a brand new series that's launching. It's called Opus X and the first book is Obsidian Detective. Two rebels whose worlds collide on a planetary level. On the fringes of human space, a murder will light a fuse and send two different people colliding together. She lives on Earth, where peace among the population is a given. He is on the fringe of society, where authority 
is how much power you wield. She's from the powerful, the elite, he's with the military. Both want the truth, but is revealing the truth good for society? Check out Obsidian Detective, the very first book that's up for pre-order now, from the new series Opus X by Michael Anderley. If you love comics the way I do, go check out Cool Comics in My Collection at edgosney.com. Ed runs one of the best comics blogs on the internet. New episodes each Thursday come out digging into the things that we have loved about comics and comic collecting. There's something there for everyone. Go check out Cool Comics in My Collection at edgosney.com. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Michael Mame back on the show with me. Uh, last year, uh, the end of last summer, he was with us talking about his brand new debut book, and it was called Planet Side, and it was one of the very best military sci-fi uh, books that, that I'd ever had the, the privilege of reading, and he has followed it up with an equally amazing book, and it's called Space Side. It's out everywhere now. Uh, welcome back to the show, Michael. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. Hey. I'm excited to have you back. Um, the it, It's been been a, uh, quite a year for you, hasn't it? Yeah, it's gone. It's gone. Uh, it's gone pretty well. Um, you know, with the, with the debut uh, doing doing as well as it did, and, and and with a new book out for a couple of weeks now. Um, especially on audio, uh, we hit the top of some of the charts coming out first first thing on audio, which was really really exciting. Um, yeah, so it's it's going really well. No doubt, uh, audio. It has has done amazing things the last few years. Um, you know, for so long, uh, audio books just seem to be this niche that, you know, a few uh, kind of hardcore readers, you know, really got into audio books. And it's it's really kind of one of the the forefront formats now. It's 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 crazy, but there's so much good stuff is coming out right now, and uh, it's really a great way to consume books. It is well, it's going up. You know, as as a writer, it's it's a it's a great way to get paid too. Oh yeah, uh, because it's growing. It's growing. Uh, you know, it grew fifteen percent year over year audio sales. You know, compared to one or two percent for for uh, you know ebooks. So so it's just a growing market, and uh, we just happened to hit there. And that's my my book really kind of resonated with that community for whatever reason, um, and and that's really been our our best selling market. Yeah. Um, how, what kind of feedback have you gotten from, well, you know, when we talked last year, book one was just really coming out and yep. there was, uh, you know, a, a lot of unknowns, uh, you know, you know, you knew that you had a fantastic book and you were getting a lot of great reviews on it. Um, but you know, since then, as the months have gone on, what kind of feedback have you gotten from readers and, uh, you know, did, did the characters, uh, really resonate with people? Uh, it seems to have. Um, I, I've got some really nice feedback. People have contacted me through my website and told me, you know, and, and I really get excited about it when veterans do that. Um, when when I hear from a veteran and they say, "Hey, man, you got this right," you know that that really makes me feel pretty good. Um, and the, the thing about Planet Side that that really, you know, it never really exploded or anything on the market, but it just stayed really, really steady in sales for you know for the whole year. Um, so, you know, to me, when that happens, it's because people are telling other people about it. Um, and I think really word of mouth is kind of what's what's gotten us to where we are. Um, you know, and I've been really, really happy. I mean, that just makes me happy. You know, that that's the thing. If someone if someone reads it. The greatest compliment they can give me is to tell somebody else to read it. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, well, speaking of military, uh, like you mentioned a minute ago, uh, you know, when we chatted last year, we talked about your time at West Point and uh, that uh, that that's really where you made the decision that you wanted to be a writer and uh, and that you told your mom that. And and she was you said that she was the only person that never doubted you and, and that, you know, took you seriously. Um and, and, you know, we, we talked more about your military career and just how much that you love soldiers. And, uh, you know, when you get to write military science fiction, um, does, does that love of, of, of the military and military personnel come out in the writing? I think it really does. Um, you know, I try to write soldiers that other soldiers will recognize. Not, you know, I don't base any characters off of individual people. Um, 
but I try to write guys that we all know. Or, or, you know, and I say guys, uh, soldiers that we all know, women too. Um, you know, just the type of people that everybody knew a guy like that, you know. Um, and if you, read, if you read my character in Planet Side, a guy named Mac, I mean, everybody knew a guy like that. You know, and I, I've, had, I've had maybe a dozen people tell me that. A dozen veterans will tell me that. You know, this guy really resonated. But the thing for me that, that I really try to get right is the relationships between people. You know, the between people of different ranks and things like that. Uh, I think there's kind of a misconception with civilians that, you know, things things in the army are someone says to do it and everybody just does it. And that's just absolutely not any more true than in anywhere else in the world. They do, you know, but do they do it or do they do it and drag their feet or do they do it and complain about it? Or, you know, yeah, it, it's it's just like anywhere else in the world with those relationships. Yeah, there's a boss and everyone has their opinion of the boss. And sometimes that opinion is, Hey, this is the best boss ever. I'm just going to do, I'm, I'm going to do it. And sometimes it's, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, you know? Um, but we're going to do it because we have to right up until the point where we can get away with not doing it. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing that I try to convey. Well, and one thing that I love about your writing is that you portray characters as humans. And um, I, I think that military science fiction gets uh, – and, and for, for people that don't really maybe understand the genre or um, kind of have preconceived notions uh, so they kind of steer away from it because they don't really understand what the stories are about um, – and and some people and you know that probably some of that is is rightfully so because I've read some military sci-fi where every character in the book is a cookie cutter, um, you know of of some character that you've seen in a movie or something and it's just very predictable. But your characters, though this is in a military style setting, th these are human characters and you allow them to be human within the rank structure and uh, that's what I really love about it is it's it's military sci-fi and it just still feels like an adventure book. Well, I, I thank you. Um, you know, and I think some people would say, and some people have said, uh, that it's not, what I write isn't pure military sci-fi. You know, it, it's kind of a, it's a kind of a thriller mystery set in a military sci-fi world. Um, and, and that's fair. You know, I think some people come into military sci-fi with the expectation of, hey, we're going to have rockets and we're going to have tanks and lasers and we're all going to blow each other up. <laughs> and that's absolutely not what I, I write. Uh, I, I could write that. I, I may write that at some point because um, it would be a lot of fun. Um, but, but really, that's not what I've written with Planet Side and Space Side. They're, they're kind of, you know, they're, they're really centered around Carl Butler um, and his relationship with, with other people and, and his ability to get to the bottom of a pretty complex problem. Yeah. Well, and, and the mystery thriller aspect, um, you know, last time we talked about your, your early love of mysteries and thrillers and, and it definitely comes out in, in, uh, in these books that, uh, you know, there's more going on here. And I think it really adds to the depth of the story that, uh, that the, it's a little more complex. There's more going on here. And I think we'll broaden it, it open to a much wider audience than just your, typical military sci-fi is that something you ever think about when you're writing like who the intended audience is um i try not to um i do think about it and i, I do believe that you know and, I, and i've had a lot of people come to me my dad you know for example who who doesn't like science fiction at all um he, he read my first book very grudgingly um because you know he's my dad and he kind of has to um you know, and he loved it. And he's like, I don't like sci-fi. I like this, you know, um, because you, it, it, it's it, if if he can find the fans um, and that's that's always the trick. I think, you know, fans of guys like Nelson DeMille or somebody like that who write, you know, military based fiction. Um, I, I think the audience could be somewhat of the same. But at the same time, you know, we, we've got we got some aliens and we got some we got some you know, blasters and, and stuff like that. So I do think it can appeal across genre. That's just super hard to market, you know, so you really can't control how that's going to happen or, or, you know, how that's going to get out there. And I don't really think I've hit that market totally. 
Um, I do think that there are some thriller, you know, readers who, who, who read me, but I don't really think that market's really found me in, in, in total yet. Gotcha. Um, Space Side is the direct sequel to Planet Side, um, yet this really reads like a completely different book. Um, it, yes, it's a continuation of the story, but man, does it take a left turn, um, which, which is great because I think this book would, would uh, stand alone completely as its own story. Uh, and if you've read the first one, then, you know, you get the bonus of, of having all the, the detailed backstory. Um, but when you when you first came um, out with this book and and uh, Harper uh, published it, uh, what was the plan for the the grand overarching story? Did, did and what, I mean, I what was the plan the, when, I, when they bought the first one? Yeah, yeah. Did did you have a, a number of <laughs> books planned and, yeah, and one. where the stories? <laughs> <laughs> I had one planned, man. I had Planet Side plans. That was it. Um, I didn't think there was a sequel in my head when I wrote planet side, I wrote it to be its own book and it does have, a, you know, depending on how you read, there are people who say, Oh, that doesn't have an ending. It, it's nebulous. Yeah. To me, it kind of does. Um, so, yeah, I thought it was a very satisfying ending. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think, I think more people than not, but I have had people say that it, it's not, you know, which, but they said it in terms of I'm ready for book two, which, you know, I'm, I'm not sad about that. Um, but when I wrote Planet Side, I had no earthly idea that there would ever be a sequel. And then I got the contract and it said, Hey, the second book will be the same character in the same world. And I'm like, all right, that's good to know. Let me get started. So, so I really started from, okay, this big thing at the end of Planet Side, and I'm not going to spoil it because, because, you know, ho hopefully there's someone listening who hasn't read Planet Side and might want to. Um, but this big thing happens at the end of planet side and it's happened and it's over. And so I started space side from, uh, okay, well, what's next? You know, and then I, so I set, so I set Butler in this new environment. He's out of the army. Um, and he's in this corporate environment, you know, and he's dealing with all the after effects of, of what happens at the end of book one, because I think, I think a lot of sequels miss that, you know, they move on to the next story. And I do move on to the next story. And as you said, it, it kind of stands alone. Uh, and that's intentional. Like you could read Space Side without reading Planet Side. But I do think you'd have a lot of questions about how he got to be the way he is. You know, and why, why are people staring at him on the bus? Um, you know, because that's kind of how it goes. You see these huge stories, you know, um, I, I kind of feel for Luke Skywalker. You know, I know there's some people who don't care for the, some of those, some of the later movies, but I get why he's hiding away on the island. You know, he's done these huge things. He he can't go to base Starbucks without everybody staring at him and like, oh, you're Luke Skywalker. Well, that's Carl Butler. You know, he did this big thing and he can't even walk out of his house without people knowing who he is. Um, so I just kind of started from there and uh, Space Eye was a lot harder to write. Um, I really struggled for a while trying to find the story. I wrote it three or four times for myself uh, before I was ready uh, to get it out to readers. Um, and then I did a pretty significant edit um, pretty late in the process to, to kind of – book two is hard. I mean for everybody. Every author you talk to will tell you that book two is the hardest thing they've ever done because um, you're on a deadline too. <laughs> Right, yeah. There's, you know, the I talk a lot about the, the for book one the the gift of anonymity. You know, nobody knows that you're writing it, and there's no deadlines, and and you just do it when you want to. But then book two is a whole completely different thing. Right, yeah. Book one, you could take your time, and the other thing with book one is when you sell it, it's already done. I mean, they bought somebody bought that from you, already having read it. Book book two. They bought it knowing nothing, you know, <laughs> and then I sent them an outline that they approved and then I didn't follow it, um, <laughs> you know, so you, you, there's <laughs> there's a little bit of fear there when you're doing that for the first time. So that was that was a challenging part of the process for me. And it really kind of slowed me down. But it, but it turned out OK in the end. I, I just 
you know, it was a really, really different process to get to it. Well, I'm going to ask you a very unfair question sure. uh, because, the, you know, the, it, it's one of these, you know, who knows. But d- thinking back, if you would have known that there would be a space side before you or, you know, while you're working on planet side, would you have ended that first book differently? Uh, or do you do you think you would have done yourself more harm uh, by, you know, planning and, and, and leaving open uh, this possibility for book two? Uh, I might have changed it, but if I had, I think I would have wrecked it, but I might have done it trying to leave myself an opening, whereas where I closed it, it really gave me the opportunity to open it in a new way, um, as opposed to having to pick up from a set spot. So Space Side, for, for anyone who, who doesn't know, picks up almost probably over two years after when planet side is is happened so so there's some stuff that's happened in the interim and i do summarize some of that in the first chapter um you know but there's been a there's been a time since it's happened um and i think that the way that i ended planet side gave me the freedom to make space side stand by itself um which and i'm happy i like it i like how it turned out and i think that that's good um and i learned a lot from doing that to which really helped when it came time to do book three so well, yeah, the, the best thing you want as a reader is to to finish a book to be completely satisfied with that character's arc but to also have that uh uh that experience of, of kind of walking around with the characters in your head and wondering what happens to them after that you know like like the the writer doesn't owe me anymore he completely landed the story but I, I just wonder what's going on, and if you could, you know, if you could end a book like that every time, uh, you know, satisfying readers but leaving them wanting more. I think that's what we all strive for. I think yes, I, that's what I'm trying to do. I love books like that. You know, I don't mind a good trilogy, like if you know it's going to be a trilogy. But that when that second book ends and there's no ending, and you have to wait a year. To me, that is there. There's a little bit of unsatisfying, you know, unsatisfactory. And I'm not saying I'll never write a book like that because I might, but right now I'm trying not to. Right now I'm trying to write books with beginnings, middles, and ends that happen to fit together. Um, and I think I've done that with the first two, um, and, and I set out to do it again. And I think I did it with book three too, which will come out next year. Well, you know the. Uh... The, in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the Two Towers is no one's favorite book. Uh, it it absolutely reads like a middle book. And uh, you know, to to write a book two like Space Side that uh, that arguably is better than the first book uh, is is quite an achievement. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, it it yeah, it's a sequel, but but it's definitely not a middle book. Um, and when you see all three of them together. You know, so when all three people, so if somebody discovers me, you know, two years from now, when all three books are, are side by side on the shelf and they start with one, two and three, um, they're they're not going to feel it's not going to feel like a middle book because it's really not transitional um, to get to uh, the third book, which has no name yet. Um, we're working on that. So so I'm calling it Planet Side Three. But. You could read book one and then book three without ever reading Space Side, and I think you'd be fine. Because because the same backstory is there. I mean, you know, Butler's baggage doesn't change a lot from book one to book two. I mean, it changes a lot at the end of book one, but the things in book two don't change it that much. You know, he's looking for redemption, obviously, and, you know, maybe he finds it, but he's not the kind of guy who's going to find that very you know, for very long. So, so I think in book three, he comes with a lot of the same baggage. Um, and book three definitely has its own, its own arc. And I say that right now with my agent and editor not having read book three. So it could be totally different by the time you see it. But I personally think it's the best thing I've ever written. So we'll see. I, I, I think it'll be, I think it'll be pretty good. 
Well, we've we've kind of danced around and alluded to that ending uh, of Planet Side that then gives us this beginning for Space Side, um, and without giving anything away there, and, and you already said uh, that the Butler is is no longer in the military and he's right. he's a civilian now, um, and you personally uh, are are retired from the military and, and teaching school now. We talked about last year uh, how you're teaching English. Um, how much? Uh, of yourself, you know, did you get to kind of work out this life transition in, in the pros uh, of this? Um, almost none. Uh, the idea of it, though, the idea, that's where the idea came from. The idea came from me, um, you know, in, in the transition that I was making. But that was it. It was the because the, his transition is way, way different. I did not go that line. I did not go into the military industrial complex the way that he did. A lot of guys do. And it's a very real, it's a very real situation, but not one that I've actually been part of. So it's all fiction. And it's not big. I didn't really talk to anybody about it. I just know that guys do that. And it's a very common thing that, you know, a lot of people will probably relate to. Um, but then he's his own guy and he's kind of famous by the end of planet side. So I wrote some of that in there too. Um, and I also wrote it in the way that I kind of saw some of those guys when I was still in the military. Um, you know, there's a scene, there's a scene where he shows up on a military base. This is in space side. There's that scene where he shows up on the military base to see uh, the guy from, from planet side, you know, and he's in the office and they're kind of writing him off as somebody trying to sell something. Okay. And I say that because I've done that, <laughs> you know, from the military side, I'm like, uh, who's this guy here trying to sell? You know, he, he says some, it was some, you know, some retired guy out, out of the army and, and, you know, he's there trying to, trying to sell you something, um, you know, and, and usually trying to sell it to my boss. And it was usually my, you know, my job to, to stall him and, and, and try and get rid of him, uh, you know, or not. It was, you know, or, or, or welcome him in or, or, or all that. But I saw that kind of thing happen a lot of times. Um, you know, so it was kind of a real situation. I just, I just wrote it from the opposite side. Well, well, Butler finds himself in uh, in in a unique situation, uh, in in working uh, in a unique situation. Tell us about um, this uh, this VR um, setup that he that he gets involved in. Oh yeah, so at the very yeah, that's chapter one. I feel we yeah you know, we, we can talk about that. Um, well. So it's funny how that came about. So I was thinking about, uh, as I was thinking about space side, and you know, you ask if, 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 if you're writing for a certain audience. So I'll, I'll kind of address it from that fashion. And I was writing space side and I, I'm, you know, I'm looking at like 50% of the book and there's really no action or not a lot of action. There's no combat, action, you know, and there's really no way for him to get he's in he's in a city. He's in a city working for a corporation. He 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 can't just, you know, fast rope into the other company and blow the bob. So so there's really no way to do that. And I'm like, man, the the military fans of Planet Side who who you know who liked that aspect of Planet Side are really not gonna care for this. So I gotta come up with a combat scene. So so I'm thinking, okay, well, how do you do that? You know, and, and so I put him into a scene. But I put him into a military scene where he's surrounded by civilians. Um, and I try to, one, it was to get the combat action in there. Two, it's the first chapter, and it really kind of establishes where he is mentally. Because, um, you know, he's having kind of a little bit of a PTSD session, um, you know, at least through the first half of the book, um, where he's, he's seen a therapist. Um, he's got some scars left over from the battles that he's fought before. You know, and then the corporation kind of throws him into a into a simulator for fun to play with the other guys because everyone wants to play against the war hero. And I did that for a lot of reasons. So so that that scene to me does a lot. One, it gave me the combat scene that I really kind of wanted, you know, in the first quarter of the book because I think people might expect that. Um, you know, so so I kind of throw throw that bone to to that particular reader. Two. I think that civilians take a lot of things. They, they're not, they don't think about it. 
You know, nobody puts Butler in that situation thinking of the damage that it's going to do to him. You know, just like nobody invites me to a memorial service, I just, you know, with at my school thinking that that's going to, you know, set me off pretty hard. You know, because the last time I was standing in memorial service was for people that I knew. Um, you know, and nobody, they don't just don't think about it. It wasn't it wasn't mean. It wasn't intentional. It's just a routine thing. And they don't know. And so that's kind of embedded in there. And I think uh, I think some veterans will pick up on that one. Um, so so there was that scene did a lot. Um, a lot of different things. And then, of course, it, it really sets. I mean, Butler's with his therapist at the very next scene. And, you know, he's kind of talking about that. And that gives him a chance. In talking to the therapist, I mean, the therapist is really a fourth wall kind of character where he's kind of telling the reader what's going on, you know, right? by talking which, to his therapist. Which is a brilliant way to do that instead of just the giant info dump. Um, you know, we get to not, – not only are you educating the reader, but we're also getting those glimpses uh, of, of Butler's character, and we're, we're getting character growth and, and more dimension uh, out of that as, as well as – uh, adding that character was, was a real genius thing to do. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I try to avoid that uh, info dump uh, thing. Sure. Um, but I, sometimes I, you have to have an info dump. You've you, got to tell people stuff. You do. You do. And, uh, but I, and, and, I, and there are books, different kinds of books that, that require it more. Um, with a first-person story, I, I just – you know, it's Butler's telling you his story. So it's first person. So he's going to tell you his story, and sometimes that's info. Um, yeah, but I try to do that. Um, and develop them that way. And I think the people who like space side better are the Butler fan. Um, because I do think I'm not going to say he's thin in, in planet side. I, I don't think that, but, but he certainly expands a lot. Uh, you know, he gains a lot of depth in space side. And I think, I think the people who show up for the character, and I really think that's most, most of my readers, um, most of my readers of book two, anyway, um, I think, or more than anything, coming back to the character, um, I, I think the, they're, those those people are, are mostly satisfied with book two. Well, I would think not that that Butler is is a thin character in book one, but your uh, the the lens that you use is, is wider. It's a it's a bigger scope, I think, in book one. And book two really focuses down on him, and and we the the, the story tightens on him. Um, it is how I kind of interpret it as I was reading. Yeah, now that you say that, that that makes that's that's exactly it. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um. So, and and I know being being a book two, uh, the sequel. There's there's a whole lot we can't talk about. Yeah. Um. But there's, uh, <coughs> you know, the story kind of morphs into this this uh, murder mystery, uh, you know, and a kind of a conspiracy thriller. Um, in, in a lot of ways, what are, are there any things that you can tell the listeners about, uh, kind of the, from, from this place where he starts the stuff that starts happening around him? Yeah, I think, well, I mean, I think I can give the, I can give the setup for it. Um, you know, he, he's kind of, so he's in a corporate world and nobody really asks him to do any work. Um, he's kind of there as a big name. To, to, you know, to use his contacts when he can and, you know, attend social functions and, uh, you know, make everybody kind of feel good that they get to they get to work with a war hero. And, and they, you know, they trot him out for special occasions and stuff like that. And then one day his boss calls him in and he says, hey, there's something uh, there's something going on at, at our competitor. They, they've been they've had a they've had a computer breach. And Butler's like, OK, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Um, but he's like, so he wants Butler to dig into it because he thinks that Butler's skill set, which is knowing people, um, you know, and having contact, he thinks that fits because he knows that they're not going to get anything officially. So he wants him to, you know, find some people, you know, in that company and, and kind of find out what they know. And that just sets Butler down the road to this mystery. Um, and of course, as with with every mystery that, that's worth anything, it. it Things are more than what they first seem. <laughs> uh, how fun is it to write uh, a story like this with the the futuristic sci-fi backdrop uh, that you get to play with? And and how concerned 
argue uh, or not about making the uh, the science believable and um, you know trending toward hard sci-fi or making those decisions not to you know when you're writing science fiction what what of those decisions comes into play? Um, I think my critics would say that I don't I don't write sci-fi enough, right? That it feels too much like our own world, which is a fair that's a that's a fair criticism. Uh, in these books, I have chosen well well with Planet Side specifically, I chose to write in a very modern combat style um, because one that's what I know. Two and two, that's what I wanted to write. Um, you know, and, and that first book has that that whole allegory thing going on um, to Afghanistan, and I think that's what I was doing. Well, that kind of locked me in for book two. <laughs> um, you know, with 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 the tech and, and and the stuff in the world. So my sci-fi world is fairly, you know, it looks a lot like twenty thirty. Um, you know, like. It's there's nothing going on in my world that people today are going to look at and go, oh, that's not going to happen. I mean, it, there, there's nothing amazing or astounding. I mean, I'm not like Cameron Hurley, who's just inventing this new awesome science in her books and, and beaming soldiers and beams of light, which was amazing. And yeah, that's not what I, wrote, you know, so so it's it's fairly mundane on the science fiction part. Um and it's not particularly hard science fiction. I get away with that because Butler, is, it's a first person story. So Butler is absolutely used to all the technology and he doesn't bother to think about it. Just any more than you think about the technology that makes an elevator work. You, you know, if you were describing it, you'd say, hey, I got in on I got in the elevator and I got out on the 15th floor. And that's all you would that would be the only thought you gave it, you know, unless something went wrong. But 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 for you. An elevator, it's just mundane. And so for Butler, he gets on this ship. He doesn't know how it works. He gets on one place. He gets in the cryopod. He gets out the next place, and he's on the next planet, and, and that's that. Um, you know, he has his routines around him and stuff like that, um, but, but he doesn't really think too much about the tech other than, you know, how it helps him or hurts him. So, so I, you know, I do want to write some hard sci-fi. I have a really good hard sci-fi book in my notebook that I'm going to write one day um, after I finish writing all these other books I have <laughs> under contract. Well, that, that's a good problem to have though, right? It's not a bad problem to have. Yeah. yeah. So we started off on a two book deal for just planet side and space side. Uh, and we recently announced uh, two more books with Harper Voyager. Um, so the first, which first of which will be planet side three, which will be out next year. Um, and the fourth one we're still talking about, we, we aren't sure if it's going to be a planet side four, um, or, or if it'll be something different. So, but we'll be, I'll be talking to my editor about that in the next month or so. Well, I, I really loved planet side when it came out and space side, uh, just ratcheted up the tension, uh, and the, the characters and, and for me, the fun, this book was so much fun to read. And, uh, you know, in a world where, um, a lot of our genre fiction can get very serious and very self-important. Um, one thing that I love is, is a good science fiction story that I can just have fun with and that, you know, I feel closer to the characters at the end. Um, but I was, I was entertained and, uh, and this book does that, you know, from page to page to page. Um, so I absolutely love it. Thanks. I appreciate that. I definitely, these books definitely do not try to take themselves too seriously. <laughs> So, so book three is going to be out about this time next year, late summer. I think 2020? so. I, I, we don't really have a date. Um, we're, I know when it's due. Um, I, I have a due date, uh, but but Harper really hasn't released their 2020 schedule yet. So, I I would imagine, you know, about this time next year, but it could go later. Um, it probably won't go earlier, um, but a lot of that depends on what other books they've got coming and, and what they're you know, what Voyager's trying to do. So, um, yeah, that's... Well, are your are your English students uh, impressed with your publishing career? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I think some of them definitely are. I, I def some of my students have read my books and, and are definitely fans. Um, you know, I, I really have a new batch of students this year. So, you know, I've only been teaching these guys about four weeks. 
Um, and, you know, Space Side kind of came out and they're just now kind of getting the idea that, you know, it's real. And it's, it's, it's not a small deal. Um, you know, not that it's a huge deal or anything, but it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so I think, you know, and, and anytime I can use it to get them interested in reading or writing, I'm going to use it because when you, when you're teaching high school boys, you got to use any trick you got. <laughs> Any trick you got, that's for sure. Well, Michael, I absolutely love it. Um, you know, I could sit here and just gush over the book all day long, but uh, it's uh, we're going to put a link to it in the show notes and send everybody to pick up a copy of Planet Side and Space Side, uh, both available everywhere now. Uh, mass market paperback, audiobook, Kindle edition. Uh, there'll be links to it in the show notes. Uh, Michael, if, if folks want to get in touch with you, dig into the news going on, is there a place where they can find you online? Uh, probably the easiest place to find me is at michaelmame.com, uh, spelled, spelled just like my name on the book title. Um, that, that's the easiest place. There's a contact page there that'll get you to my email. And I'm also at Michael Mame on Twitter, and I'm, I'm there quite a bit. Awesome. Well, we're going to send everybody to see you and to buy the books. Michael, thank you so much Appreciate for coming Thanks back a on lot. the show. Thank you to Michael Mame for joining me today. Be sure to pick up his book, Space Side, or the first book in the series, Planet Side. There's links to it in the show notes. Stay tuned now for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. You took a terrible risk tonight. Why? You don't know? The first rule. I was told by a friend that I shouldn't reveal my gift to anyone who doesn't have a gift themselves. That's exactly right. Because everyone we tell dies. Yes. You might have marked me for death. Made you a target for a ghost. Why can't people know what we can do? What makes it so dangerous? Valerie took up the fireplace prongs and stabbed the logs. It's called the Great Curse. Sparks exploded from glowing crevices and drizzled upwards, ricocheting off the black belly of the cauldron, turning into tiny ashes that disappeared up the chimney. It was cast by a powerful witch over 300 years ago. Witch? Sorry, but witch? Please, there's no such thing. Valerie closed her eyes. A spoon leapt from Jason's dish and caught him in the temple. He wiped melted ice cream from his cheek. You were saying? She cast the curse to stop the witch trials. In Salem? Jason searched his memory. 1690... 1692. They burned her alive in the Salem Common. The only witch to be burned. The cauldron smoked slightly. Its contents had evaporated. A sharp, charred scent filled the room. Wait, said Jason. There were no witches. They were just, I don't know, victims of religious hysteria right? So you're saying the witch trials were justified? Justified? So if a witch did exist, it would be okay to kill her? No, I just thought... You're right. Never mind. There was one witch in Salem, at least. A woman with a powerful gift. She only wanted to protect people like us. To give the gifted their anonymity, refuge. She cast the great curse as she burned. She proclaimed that mortals who know a witch shall know death. And that is the great curse. And it's still in effect after all this time. Mortal, as in non-gifted. No mortal can know about you, about any authentic witch. Jason winced. Isn't there another word besides that? She shrugged. So no one can know what I am, what I can do, or else they become a target. Right. The spirit world will obey the great curse and try to kill them. The spirit world. The Other Realm. Jason rubbed his eyes. 
How much of this was reality and how much of this was Valerie's nutty brand of mysticism? He felt himself pulling back, as usual, for fear of contagion. He'd spent his whole life reading science fiction. He hated paranormal tales. This was... this was... not his genre.